Good afternoon, namaste, and assalamu alaikum. I'm Siddharth Man Shakya, uh, a junior majoring in art history at Virginia Commonwealth University in Qatar. Uh, honorable speakers, guests, and my fellow colleagues, it has been a great, great pleasure to be actually in front of uh, uh, our speakers who we have been studying for the past two and a half years. Uh, we've seen their work. We have now gotten the chance, the amazing chance to actually meet them in person and listen to their lectures. It is my honor to introduce you to Ms. Huda Abifaritz, the founding creative, creative director of CATH Foundation and the uh, leading specialist in bilingual type, uh, typographic design and research. She obtained her graphic design degrees from Yale University School of Art, uh, Rhode, Island, uh, Rhode Island School of Design, and has taught uh, design and typograph typographical courses at the, university, uh, at the American University of Beirut and American University in Dubai, where she was the chairperson of the Visual Communication Department. She also served as a jury member of the Victoria Albert Museum's uh, Jamil Prize for Islamic Art and Design 2013, among her notable contribution to the field. She is the author of several major, major publications, including uh, Arabic Typography, a comprehensive source book, and experimental Arabic type, among many others. Her presentation today is entitled Arabic Typography and the Shaping of the Modern Design Culture. Please put your hands together and help me welcome Ms. Abu, Ms. Uh, Huda Abifaritz. Am I just as good now? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Sheila and um, Jonathan, for inviting me, finally. No. <laughs> I've been attending this conference from the beginning, and I'm a big fan, so it's very, um, it's of course much nicer to be in the audience than to be on stage, but thank you. And also thank you for our hosts and for all the people that have made this, this conference possible. Um, I am uh, going to try and uh, read from a paper, but I'm not very good at that, so I will probably be a little bit, um, uh, as I do it as a designer, a bit chaotic, but bear with me. I have nice pictures. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Arabic typography and the shaping of a modern uh, print culture. Um, typography is a building block of written communication. At this juncture in our world history where most cities around the world are connected, where an overwhelming amount of knowledge is available, searchable, and almost free, where knowledge and new media are capable of moving people to almost extreme measures, the written word and, visual, and its visual aspects have become vital means of, of self-expression. Um, in this paper, I will present a brief overview of the complex relationship between type design and projects of modernity since the late 19th century. Um, I will highlight the relation between text, content, aesthetics, and technology at particular moments in modern history. Okay. And I will skip parts of my paper because it's too wordy. Um, so, this is what I live by. Um, in his seminal book um, for, type design, for graphic designers in this room, you should really have this book called Modern Typography by Robert Kinross. He states that all typography is intrinsically modern. Uh, for it facilitated the development of the modern world by exhibiting a rational way of structuring information, standardizing production, and widely disseminating knowledge. I think the art historians in this, in the Islamic art historians and manuscript historians most probably would also probably some of that uh, statement applies to that tradition as well, especially in the Arabic world. Um, similarly, modern Arabic typography was employed for the advancement of Arab societies, the eradication of illiteracy and the adaptation of the script to technological progress. The, um, the simplification of the Arabic printing types was advocated for speeding up the production of educational and scientific material in the Arabic language, thus shaping modern Arab societies. 
Um, the first aspect of the printing press that interests us here are standardization and its lasting effect on the Arabic language and culture in particular. In its inherent ability to fix knowledge across a wide geographic and demographic spread through the exact reproduction of content and its dissemination, it unified the classical Arabic language and writing styles. I am not an Arabist, but this would, this would make sense in a way. Um, by, it, by this, it created a uniform um, and united Arabic community and a sense of belonging to a greater nation. And in this way, it ultimately also created a shared destiny. So in a way, um, printing became the binding agent of Arab culture. Again, this could apply to the writing and the language. Um, now, I'm going to try and um, do a very fast forward through history. So I will probably read a little bit. And if I find myself talking too much, I will um, time myself and then just kind of run through the slides. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> okay. I might not leave the stage. Um, OK. Um, so I will try to um, uh, talk. I mean, OK. Back check. Handset movable type was the first um, technology for typography. And, of, and we all know the history uh, to a certain extent that it started in Europe. And so was also the first printed books. Um, Handset movable type was a technology of the 16th century, and it made its way into the Arab world in the 18th century but was not, a, you know, was not really uh, adopted on a wide scale until the 19th century. So before that time, most Arabic typographic printing was done in Europe. And um, Arabic European publications were originally produced for a large part for and by European scholars interested in the science and literature of, of the Arab world and therefore wanting to read the text in the original, um, in the original text, in the original language. Um, but some of the original examples, um, or the earliest examples in this case, were, uh, were uh, religious texts, so Bibles, uh, liturgical Christian uh, texts that were uh, produced to be sold and disseminated in the Arab world, but also, as in this example, the next one, an attempt to make um, a commercial venture out of creating and printing a Quran and selling it to, in the Ottoman world. Um, so in the second example, it is clearly um, that the types that were used lacked fluidity and the elegance that is customary in, uh, in Islam contemporary and at that time contemporary uh, Quranic text. So the page layout is also pretty stark and poor in ornamentation. Uh, and so it comes as no, disguise, no surprise that this project was undertaken by a Venetian, Venetian printer would end as a financial failure. Of course, it never reached the intended, uh, the, well, it was never accepted or never even reached the intended destination. Um, but then later on, the, the church um, invested in printing Arabic quality, uh, quality Arabic liturgical books. And uh, they started to look at, at the traditional calligraphic tradition of, of the Arab world and tried to, to uh, imitate that and produce types that are legible by Arab standards. They um, eventually the, they progressed as far as hiring what we would call or employing uh, type designers, but there was no type designers, so they called them punch cutters, and um, trying to look at ways to incorporate that calligraphic quality into, sto into cutting through lead. And so they had people like uh, Robert Grandjean, one of the most famous uh, Spanish counters of the 16th century, produced types. And his types became uh, the model for other printing presses and other uh, people interested in producing Arabic, uh, uh, printing in Arabic type. So this is an example from the Netherlands by Rafael Engers, um, Francisco Rafael Engers, who worked in, uh, in uh, Antwerp for Plantin Moretus um, um, printing house, and then moved to the Netherlands and started the Arabic uh, studies tradition, uh, the Arabic studies department in the University of Leiden, and to, to produce type and, and text for their books and to learn about the Arabic, they started type cutting their own fonts and actually 
uh, printing Arabic books, and the Grand Jean were the models that they followed. The Grand Jean kind of had a, a, an influence throughout. I will show it very quickly. So this is another example from France, and again, um, it was it was commissioned by Savary de Breve, the type designer uh, and printer was Etienne Paulin, and they set up the Imprimerie des Langues Orientales in Paris, and they used again the Grand Jean as a model and develop their own version of that. So all these Arabic um, types, um, hey, oh, my slide shows something different than when I see that, okay. Um, so, th so this became a model that, that, that was repeated throughout. Uh, feels like I'm going back in time, but I'm not, okay. Um, Even though European Arabic types evolved and became aesthetically sophisticated as time progressed, I show you only a few examples, it's too long a story otherwise, um, they remained intrinsically foreign to Ottoman and Arab readers. Design innovation was mostly concentrated on technological innovation, so technical innovation, namely on how to adapt the handset typographic technology devised for the Latin script to the handwritten cursive script of calligraphic tradition such as Arabic. The movable type technology uh, presented a number of technical challenges for Arabic type design. The first challenge was an aesthetic one, how to translate the fluidity and rhythm of Arabic calligraphic form into rigid and disconnected lead blocks. Therefore, how to remain legible and culturally acceptable to the educated readers. And you have to remember that in the 16th century, it was a very elite class that were readers, so it was not for everybody, and they had a very strong opinion, I'm sure, about what is legible and maybe still to this day that is still the case. Um, so the second challenge was a technical one. So how to ensure that the connected baseline, so that the letters uh, are precisely matched to avoid having disjointed looking text, how to incorporate the vocalization marks, which are important in many cases, a teshkil in Arabic, in an ele elegant manner and to ensure their precise position. So it's not just about aesthetics, but also they have to be matching exactly on the same letter so that there's no confusion or ambiguity in the text. And the third challenge was a practical and economic one, how to produce the character set that <coughs> consisted of letters, ligatures, vocalization marks, and keep it within a, a, an affordable a cost and also an easy way to typeset the text so that it doesn't take forever to make a, a block of text. These challenges were, of course, addressed in different ways by different printers throughout history. Um, I will um, talk about now, jump to the Arab world, uh, Ottoman in this case. Um, the Ottomans discovered printing Arabic books through the Europeans. But these books were aesthetically foreign to them and their fonts strange and very likely illegible when compared to their own standardized tradition of uh, page setting in manuscripts. This, among other reasons, could explain why it took so long before typographic printing was accepted and finally adopted in, in the Ottoman Empire for printing Arabic. Um, following a decree in uh, 1726 by Sultan Ahmed III, uh, printing secular text using Arabic fonts was finally allowed. The first Islamic printing press to make a significant contribution was the Mutafarika Press, set up in Istanbul in 1728 and run by Ibrahim Mutafarika, a man of many attributes, described as a geographer, cartographer, diplomat, administrator, author, editor, translator, printer, founder, religious scholar, courtier, soldier, pamphleteer, and many other things, I guess. So he was a very... Um, multi-talented person, um, and the Mutafarika Press managed to overcome the cultural reservations of the Ottoman elite of the 18th century by providing the Arabic printing types, uh, by providing, by proving, sorry, that Arabic printing types can be designed to match in elegance and clarity the beauty of Ottoman Nasr calligraphy. Uh, Mutafarika went as far as writing a tract on the benefits of printing for education and the dissemination of knowledge amongst the Ottoman Empire subjects and eventually obtaining permission from the Ottoman Sultan to establish a printing press. So the press produced, so I'm sorry, I go back. <laughs> okay, so we have the examples of manuscripts that people were used to looking at. These are of course Quranic manuscripts. 
but um, still, uh, when 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 Mutaferica Press was began making books that were secular and mostly scientific books, this aesthetic was adopted. So they tried to attempt not only in the way that the fonts were made, but also in the tip and the setting and the way. Um, the, the aesthetics of, of making a page, composing a page, starting with on one and then framing the text within a, a, a box. And when you had a very special edition, it was hand painted in gold and then bound in leather and stamped in gold and so forth. So there were also different kinds of books that they produced. Um, when they made secular um, further, they, they also had more modern, if you want, in, t in some ways, more modern looking books where they used illustrations and engravings, but they still kept some detailing of, of text composition, like the tapering at the end of, of the column on the, let's see if I know how to do this, oh, I don't. like here. Uh, at the end, to mark the ending of a section. So they were still they were still in their mind reading manuscripts, but then printing. Uh, okay, Mutaferica's font was nevertheless still complex for a movable type. Um, it it came close to the script, but it meant that a lot of ligatures and a lot of uh, considerations had to be made to make it work. So if you, for example, um, I tried to. Um, yeah, I tried to kind of uh, highlight some ligatures, and some ligatures were used for stylistic things. This one is in particular interesting. Keep it in mind because it will show up in another part of the lecture. But again, this is an unusual ligature of dalha, which is um, normally they're written next to each other and not connected. Um, and then you have a set of ligatures that were used for spacing. So you either stack the letters. So these were two letters. Sometimes you have more than two, or use the opposite way, stretching the letters to fit up you know, a nicer block of text. And then you had, on top of that, aesthetic ligatures that made sure that the connection of letters were just beautiful. So here you have um, three yas, but then the way they, com they connect with a calf or with a lamb or the kha or the fa, it changes slightly. So in order to make text as, as beautiful as calligraphy at the time, you had to actually, what, what, was, what was for calligraphers a natural way of making writing faster, for typographers it meant the opposite. It meant you have to do a lot of work to actually first configure how this works, put it together, and make sure it actually works. So this is your first uh, huge difference between writing and typesetting. Okay. But this was considered beautiful, and in, in many ways also modern, not by 21st century standards. Okay, so um, the, this was, um, I jump again further to um, Egypt, which was, um, Cairo was an important center and stronger. In the 19th century, Cairo was trying to take its independence from the Ottoman Empire. So you had <coughs> the first, if you want, innovators in Turkey, and then a jump or an attempt to break with Turkey, but not really, because this was still an Ottoman uh, state in some ways. I'm not a historian. If I make mistakes in history, forgive me. <laughs> OK. Um, the introduction of the printing press and the proliferation of printed matter in the mid-19th century in the Middle East sowed the seed for the Arab culture Renaissance mentioned earlier as an Nahda. It reinvigorated a transnational Arab identity and disseminated ideas of the modernization of Arab culture, inviting reflections on Arab intellectual heritage, and even uh, representations of the Arabic script itself. <coughs> The press became instrumental to the democratization of education, and with the increasing recent readership, the demand for a larger output of printed material also increased. In Egypt, Muhammad Ali Basha, uh, founder of founded the official state uh, the official state press in Bulaq, a suburb of Cairo, in, nine, in 1820. <coughs> Um, I think the, the date is con a bit contested, so I'm not sure whether it's 18, there, it's not um, accurate whether it's 1820 or 1821. On my slide it says 1819, so it's somewhere there. 
um, and it's the top. The top slide shows a little bit um, the instruction stone, and this is their new building <coughs> from the 50s, so not very new. In Egypt, Muhammad Ali. Um, okay, so the Bulak Press built upon the, their Turkish predecessors and combined that with the knowledge of local calligraphers and artisans to develop their own font uh, fonts. Um, some of which were expressly sent for training in Italy and other European cities. <clears throat> so part of the modernization project was to send local artisans to Europe to learn the art of printing and come back and actually set up this press. And still, there was a kind of mix. It was a transitional period, so there was a connection to previous Ottoman printing, or in, in ter certainly in terms of aesthetic and the skill of making the type but they wanted to develop it further. <coughs> um, so the books they were making is, again, you see the same Ottoman tradition, a bit simpler. Um, but then the swords that they were using to create these decorations were often European, probably of Italian origin. And a closer look at the type, you see a more, a more simplified version of that with the Ferica print of a kind of more, even more simplified version of the Naskhi that was uh, common and that people read. Um, so you see examples of decoration, examples of um, a kind of transitional thing between now you have a, a proper title page to a book. So even though it looks it looks it looks Ottoman, it it's as an Islamic decorative feel to it. It still is a title page and not our own one. So it's actually a modern shift going towards the, di the direction of uh, modern European typesetting. <coughs> um, another spread. <coughs> the Bulak Press um, developed its own version of concise character set that could handle effectively and elegantly the complexities of both Arabic and Turkish language. <coughs> Excuse me. As a state-owned press, the Bulak Press remained in operation for a long time. Its operational longevity and official status gave the press also its authoritarian role in setting the standards for printing and publishing in the Arabic language in the 19th century. <coughs> in the slides, for example, they, they attempted, this is from the 1930s, so it's not the 19th century anymore, but they attempted to create um, a new invention that they called Haruf et Taj, which are these little letters there as ways of adding decoration. So this is a jim, this is an elif, and this is a wow, as a sort of uh, invention for making capital letters that you could use for names. Of course, it never became widely used because it's very ornamental in some ways. But in a way, it sticks out of the text. So if it's a way to the, the, you know, um, set out the names from a, a text instead of um, making capitals. Um, but it's decidedly, uh, yeah, funny. Okay, um, the influence of Bulak, of course, was one of the main one of the um, with the invasion or with the f conflict between uh, <coughs> Muhammad Ali and, and the Ottoman sultans. They there was a period when um, Lebanon and Syria came under Egyptian rule, Muhammad's rule, actually his sons, and so the 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 the, the people in the Levant for the first time had um, education books that came from Cairo. So this must have had left some effect on the population, or at least a familiarity with that aesthetic. <coughs> ah, my voice always leaves me when I need it. OK. Beirut in the late 19th century became the new center of educational book publishing, and two new printing presses were set up by American and European missionaries in order to produce adequate material for their schools in the Arabic language and script. They first had to set up their own uh, printing presses. Um, the first was the American Press, first founded in Malta in 1822, and then moved and became operational in Beirut in, since um, 1834. It closed in 1964, uh, but not with this. It, it lost its caliber after the 19th century, in a way. 
the American press uh, first imported their printing types from England. Uh, but earlier on, it gave up the use of these types, which were not considered legible by Arab readers, and who were accustomed, again, to the Ottoman Nasr. So the press bef uh, invested in making a new Arabic type uh, that met the current trends and that people would accept. The font was, became known as El Americani, uh, the American types. It was designed and punch cut in Istanbul by Holman Halluk and cost and cost by Karl Tauschnitz in, Leiden, um, sorry, in Leipzig in 1841. The first character set consisted of 12,000 punches. It was designed after the, the traditional Nasri of late 19th century. I think I should show you an example of it. Um, and, um, and it had simplified and less modulated strokes, but had the same vertical slants that you would find in calligraphy. And the font also was very thin, um, so it was part of its, uh, some people, well actually Dr. Roper said it was a weakness. I think it's uh, interesting. I don't know if it's a weakness. Um, and what is interesting about this, it's also is set on, an, on a slant. So in a way, it's, a, it's, not, it's typographic, but it has still some relation or an interpretation of the calligraphic script. Um, another example here, again, um, it has, it's clearly has a, an influence, an ultimate influence in its design, where you look again at this beautiful dal ha, or dal tam or buta in this case. And this is characteristic of this font, but it also was in the Mutaferika character set already, uh, some hundred years before. And also another characteristic thing is this, this connection between the Aleph and the Lam Aleph, which is characteristic to this font. And it made it, gave it a very special little flavor. But it's also a way to keep the text as compact as possible. Um, another example where it has, it has a very quirky uh, character of the Aleph wood, and when it's combined next to the Lam Kha, this ligature is also a very unusual one. Anyway, um, this double, um, this one became very popular and it came to represent uh, publications uh, that were considered uh, um, key publications from the Nahda period, from the 19th century. So this is a double spread, uh, double page spread from Da'irat al Ma'arif, uh, volume 6, Beirut 18 to 82, which displays um, a combination of, again, uh, traditional features with very modern ones. So all of a sudden, the down one is not longer an on one, but it's a way of framing a title. And the title is always in a bold Naskhi font, or uh, sorry, in a bold Rukha or a bold Nastali. Uh, in this case, it's a Rukha. And, but then it has also other features. So, this, so there was, again, a very unique um, characteristic in it where the, 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 this is an a modern encyclopedia, so it was um, done alphabetically. It was um, designed after a model of um, an American encyclopedia. So it has the same structures as, Amer as the Lamat has, the combination of bilingual text, two columns, the order, the page numbering, references, and so forth. So the structure of it was Western, American, European, in Arab mind, modern. But at the same time, it has characteristics that were still carried through from the manuscript tradition. I, um, I will focus the talk on modern things, but I have to set the stage a little bit. So the second um, important printing press that had a little bit started a little bit later was the main rival of the American press, actually was designed as to rival the Americans' missionaries, and um, had a longer, long, longer life as, as functioning printing press and publisher in the Middle East, is the Catholic press. Uh, commonly known as the Imprimerie Catholique. It was founded by the Jesuit missionaries in 1848 in Beirut as a means to rival the American press. It, uh, it remained operational until uh, 2000, so it really made it through the whole Lebanese war. Um, the Catholic press originally imported the Arabic types from Paris and Lyon. 
Later, it helped. Um, it employed the help of in-house native punch cutter brother Marie Elias uh, to design their full, the first fully vocalized font that was commonly referred to as the Stambouli types. So they were clearly based on Constantinople models. So they wanted to be more authentic than the Americans. The font recreated the complexity of Ottoman calligraphy and what they, what, what they used it for the first time was to set their first Arabic Bible, which they got an award for in 1978 in an exhibition in Paris. And their invention was to create a character set so the, the, the letter and the accent were combined in one sort, which means they had a lot of letters <laughs> because it's combining not only the shape and not only the ligatures, but also all these combined with the four different vocalization marks in Arabic, which represents the soft vowels. So it was, I, I cannot imagine how many copy, how many sorts they had and what kind of a challenge it was to actually typeset this text. Um, but eventually, um, so this is an example of the Stambouli. And here you see uh, a little later version with all the accents, so you see the complexity of the script. <coughs> but they were, they were essentially um, educational publishers, and they had to produce a lot of books for their, for their courses, for their students, for their universities. So they eventually developed simpler typefaces, as you can see some examples, um, and less complex one. And they used um, different, uh, the different calligraphic styles that were, in, uh, that were in use at the time. So they had a font in Nesr, in Thuluth, Ruqa, Maghribi, Kufi, and Nastaliq. <coughs> and eventually, uh, they started producing types and selling them to other printers in the region. In 1956, uh, the Imprimerie Catholique decided that it didn't make any sense to take on the burden of having a font foundry and doing a business next to their business, so they sold their foundry to their former typesetter um, and employer. Uh, his name is Hasib Dergam, who actually set it up as an independent um, uh, publishing, um, font publishing, um, city, uh, font publishing foundry. Called, and they called it Masbak al Huruf al Sharqiya, or the Fonderie Orientale, um, which stayed in business until the 1970s and actually produced, went through all the technology of producing movable type that was cut by hand, but also mechanical phototype setting and so forth. <coughs> they missed the digital revolution, they closed before. The Industrial Revolution of the 19th century initiated a new modern way of life. It helped create an affluent middle class and nurtured a notion of a global culture. And that was, I think, not very different in the Middle East. Commercial, scientific, and cultural exchange increased er as a result of growing ease of mobility. Um, it also, the Industrial Revolution, also modified the printing industry by mechanizing a major part of the type production, complex machines that automated the production and setting of type in a faster and more economic way were reproduced, uh, were developed. They boosted the volume of publications and daily newspapers. In 1896, the German company Linotype invented a typesetting machine that cast uh, and set whole lines of text at once called the slug uh, casting Linotype setter. Linotype was first introduced in the Arab world, though, for, uh, for typesetting uh, text for newspapers, daily newspapers, um, but only in the, in the 20th century. Arabic fonts designed in the 1950s for the linotype casting uh, dispensed totally, so Arabic, one, Arabic fonts, dispensed totally with diacritics and ligatures and simplified the scripts to a minimum character set of 56 enabling the typeface to fit into one 90-channel magazine. So all of a sudden, it was um, instead of, of, so we see in, in this history that um, we start by uh, the, the designers or the punch cutter trying to imitate the script and kind of forcing the technology to do things that is not very practical to it. And then eventually that changes because, again, for economic reasons, but also because there was a demand that you had to produce your newspapers faster. It was not a choice, actually. 
Um, this is what newspapers originally looked like, so when they were still typeset in, in, um, in metal type, like this newspaper from the 19, I think, 30s, I can't read it, yeah, 33. Um, so you still see the Ottoman script and the hand setting and then only some variations for the titles. So these could have been fonts from the Imprimerie Catholique since this was uh, a newspaper in Beirut. But then, you know, that in, in the 60s and the 50s, that was not acceptable anymore. There was a need to go faster. And so uh, a special font was designed by the linotype team for uh, this linotype machine and was, I think, adopted for the first time by the Al Ahram newspaper. Um, uh, funnily enough, the name of the font is Yaqut, which, rep which is one of the most famous uh, Arab calligraphers from Baghdad in the, I don't know, I'm not good with dates. Um, but, and then, but then the font that was designed in his name is completely the opposite. It was really very rigid, very simple, very elegant in some ways for the technology. And next to that, they devised another which became really, this probably looks like what you see every day in newspapers to this day and it's probably used also. Uh, a very bold uh, version of headline type that was only really like platform shoes, you know, very heavy baseline, very rigid, very straight. But this was the look of modernity in the 1950s. Uh, the, the bold type is called Al Harf Al Jadid, and the more, a bit more elegant one was called Yakut. So that was kind of appropriate in a way. <laughs> okay. Um, Shortly after the invention of linotype, monotype company came up, invented a typesetting uh, system that was more, uh, more appropriate for book publishing because it allowed uh, for typographic refinements such as adjusting kerning uh, and you know, very useful for italics and for Arabic. So the letters could go under each other. And so again, the technology was being forced to do something that doesn't come naturally uh, to the system. But it was often used for books because books don't need to be produced so fast, so you can take your time and actually make a pretty book. And it was, in a way, a different kind of reading, where reading in a, a book is something that you take your time with. There's a very, there's a very conservative tradition of reading, whereas a newspaper is, as we heard before, it could be also read by someone else for you. So it's not really, you don't have a kind of similar relationship. A book is precious, so we can take our time in making it. So you see an example here of, of, of linotype uh, font that was, I think, used, for the top part is from a children's book from Egypt in the early 20th century, and the bottom one is a second edition in the Cyclopedia in the 19, I think, 60s and 70s by another, but by another Bustani uh, continuing this tradition of encyclopedias. <coughs> Then what happens? <laughs> From now on, we're going to see a very strong break with the tradition. So in, um, along with these high pro highly professional machines, a smaller office version, the first mechanical typewriter was introduced in 1876. Um, the typewriter moved part of the typesetting from the specialized printing houses to the office space. The typewriter took over the function of handwritten correspondence, allowing for copies to be made simultaneously. Soon it invaded all office spaces. It was used later as a model for what we have in front of us all the time, computers today. And then in the 1945-47, <coughs> and then with a bit of an interval again in the 1958 and 59, the Academy of Arabic Language in Cairo launched a language reform um, and script reform competition. It initiated a call uh, for proposals and received many applications from different um, countries and from different scholars and professionals and even amateurs. Nasri Khattar uh, was uh, uh, an architect and a, and a designer who um, was one of the people who proposed a typeface or a, a type system because it's not really a design, it's more a system that he called the Unified Arabic. Um, and it was one of the more interesting proposals among the many that they received. What his proposal dictated uh, was that Arabic could be, we could actually have one form per letter. The letters did not really have to connect, 
And that was an easy way to teach children and foreigners how to learn Arabic, so they don't have to be immediately faced with the complexity of the script. <coughs> so for him, it was fitting in the idea of fighting illiteracy and spreading knowledge and making reading even more democratic. Unified Arabic was further, um, <coughs> so this is example from his books. I find this example interesting because normally children's books are read by the parents to their children. So you have an example of the traditional nas, and then the unified Arabic, and they are sitting next to each other, like, like two languages. And it was almost um, a way to teach the children, but also to teach the parents how to teach the children. <laughs> So the parents cannot find, you know, find probably the, the, the unified Arabic illegible. So um, unified Arabic was further developed. He spent all his life until he died working on it and adapting it to new technology, <coughs> coming up with new styles, making it for um, typesetting, eventually even making connected versions. And uh, recently, um, uh, a new revival, a digital font, was produced based on his drawings. <coughs> a second um, interesting uh, project uh, was in the second phase of these proposals was by the Moroccan Ahmed Lakhtar Ghazal. Um, his proposal was to develop uh, a, a new typesetting system that actually broke the Arabic script, uh, simplified it, and took into consideration one shape, but then worked with a system where you add endings to make it a, a final shape or beginning shape, etc. And his project was not just an aesthetic one. Uh, his idea was the old original Arabic, the accents were not something optional. They had to be part of the text. It's good for p teaching Arabic the proper way. And they were, ex they were vo the vowels were not just additions, they were actual, had the position in the text. So he divided also um, a base for the accents, for the vo vocalization to put between the letters. It's an intellectual system. Um, he um, called his, his uh, system uh, Arab Standard Royale Codage Arab. It was designed for prototype setting and for digital um, production. So he's from another generation. So it wasn't about the technology, it was more a project about, again, an ideology of how do you make Arabic accessible and how do you fight illiteracy and make, um, make it yeah, easy to, to learn for, 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 for young people, but also for people within uh, Morocco that probably Arabic is not their native language. Since the 1960s and 1980s, um, and this, this is, oh, I wanted to show this because I think it's funny for those who read Arabic. Um, eventually, he, he, he was funded, he, he had a, he did, none of these proposals were accepted, by the way. And um, his, he got funding to set up an institute called the Arab uh, Institute for Arabization um, in uh, the University Mohammed Sank in Rabat. And then the UN funding ran out, so the state funded him. And eventually he did, um, ad they adopted his system for using for all um, road and signage, official signage in, in, in Morocco. So it became the kind of visual uh, representation or very, very Moroccan flavored type, just by, by the fact that it was used everywhere and still is to this day. Since the 1960s, 1980s, the invention of dry transfer type has enabled Arab designers to experiment with new letter forms, designs, and to be, to be used in posters, on cover illustrations, and other commercial graphics. Uh, the scripts varied from modern geometrical abstractions to more traditional scripts. Um, and the search for a modern design language led some people, like in this case the Iraqi poet uh, and calligrapher Muhammad Saeed Sagar, to carry on his own research and look at the, the structure and the base, the, the structural forms of Arabic, and to analyze that and say, what is it? How can we make a system that is simple, that we can build on and make many variations and many new fonts? There was this idea that 
um, was, and, and you would still find it to this day, that if you go back to the original, and we saw from the first presentation today, that was, for me, very beautiful to look at, uh, and what uh, Jonathan called scribbles. And you see the, the, this, this simplicity, this structure of the script, that even when you take it to the ultimate like skeletal scribble, there is a, there is a connection that you see how the, the script works. And some of these designers in the 60s wanted to, in a way, politically go back to the origins of Arabic, because to them that was also the Arabic language. The Arabic heritage is there. It's, it hasn't been corrupted by all foreign influences in some ways. So going back to, the, to, to this, to this um, he wrote a whole manifesto on this, which is very interesting to read. Um, but he, he, he devised this system, and it's not that he, did, he disconnected his fonts or something. It was a system and a way to analyze script. And I think it was the first time that was done more from an ideological point of view rather than technology or aesthetic. However, while these people were doing wild experiments and drawings, um, the, the, the books and the traditional books that everybody read still looked like this. So this is, again, the linotype font. Uh, Lotus used everywhere in bold and simple. So it was really kind of poor in a way. It was neither calligraphy nor experimental. Um, but it was used, and uh, I had in, I interviewed recently somebody in Cairo, a publisher, who told me that you know to him this is like my his mother's cooking. He knows it's not perfect. He knows it's even actually blotchy and badly printed. But there's an emotional connection to that because there's memories with it. I'm taking too much time. Okay. Okay. Oh, I can do that. OK. So the books um, looked like this on the inside and looked like that on the outside, experimental, playful, and drawing. Now, I come to finally today, I bring, um, and this is a part I can talk about without looking at things. So with the invention of the digital revolution, uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of um, Professions disappeared, but it also put all design and production and distribution of typography in the hands of the designers, the creators. So we go back almost a, a circle, except now our tools are, in the beginning they were difficult, but they became easier with time. Um, so you had uh, books. Hmm. So you have, for example, in the beginning, one of the first uh, companies that started doing desktop publishing and did fonts for specifically for the Macintosh was this company called Diwan in, in, in London. And they used, they worked with Sagar, the man I mentioned before, to produce um, fonts. And he designed something like this, but he also designed other typefaces that explored the older history. So inventing, you know, extreme kufi, extreme uh, uh, display types, but also practical ones. I like these two because they are very different from each other. So you look on on the, on the right hand side. Um, there is a connection to the older script, but it's also not really. It's kind of his own invention, the same here. It's his own invention, this extremely thin and um, angular, and then refined endings and so forth. Um, so there is three things that kind of relate to modern typography today. Um, first, the technology has become simpler. Uh, in the sense that it allows you to make very complex fonts, but it also allows you to make very simple things. So the discussion of technology has become less important. Um, and there is uh, three, v um, if you want, trends. One is to recreate a traditional calligraphic styles. Um, the second trend is to take the concept or the structures of, of calligraphic styles and make very modern stuff with them. And the last one is, uh, and, and that's a very strong one, it has a kind of a more practical aspect, is to make font families that combine many scripts together because uh, of branding, because of international uh, cultural dim diplomacy. So we have to talk to each other, so why not write the same script? When I'm sure everybody came on a plane that had publications that were bilingual. If you live in the Middle East, you're very, com you know, you're very comfortable with looking at bilingual texts. And it's always a discussion of how do you balance these two uh, traditions that are written from opposite directions, look very different, and have a very different development, his historical development. So Arabic fonts, when even when they went from calligraphy to typography, calligraphy was dominant. Everybody does not give up calligraphy easily. There's a very conservative tradition of reading. And in, in, in the Western script, 
the attachment is not as tight. So people are, are willing to accept different scripts and say we can read them all. So um, the first person to experiment with the first trend of recreating calligraphy in uh, digital form was um, uh, a team, uh, Thomas Milo um, and his wife and brother-in-law, who actually um, tried to recreate <coughs> the calligraphic, the traditional Ottoman Nas, using a technology at the time when he started doing it that was not, accept, you know, that did not allow for that. There was only possible to have five, 356 characters, but he wanted to make thousands. <clears throat> and I think the genius of the work at the time was that he analyzed this Arabic script and broke it up into little um, pieces and figured out a system of reconnecting these pieces. So he had 356 pieces, but he could create thousands and program it in such a way. It was um, a many years of work and uh, labor of love, I'm sure, and pain. <laughs> but he succeeded. But what happened is with time, the technology went whoosh. And I had learned from my type design teacher at Yale is that you never design for technology. You design, and then you figure out how the technology is going to deal with it. You don't work the other way around, because this is what's going to happen. And in digital times, it happens faster. So anyway, this is another example with open type. So with open type, all the possibilities of having many characters and many scripts has only become easier. And this is another um, D1 font that was also recreating the calligraphic Nasr script, but then not inventing a software and not inventing a proprietary software. Um, so you could still do the same effect with different, slight, slightly different style of Nasr. Um, this is an, um, an example of looking at uh, old calligraphic scripts and reinventing new ones. So here you have um, <coughs> the Syrian calligrapher Jamal Bustan looking at an, an older version of Naisiburi, but then inventing his own version of that, and then collaborating with the type designer uh, Mamun Sakal to produce a font that allowed for a lot of variety. So this is calligraphic, but it's not a copy of calligraphy, and it has certainly a very modern look. Um, you would say, I cannot probably read whole books of that, but, you pr but what is beautiful about it is that it allows for a variety of ornamentation. So the text can be very simple and legible for practical things, and you can keep adding to it. And you have many ligatures and many possibilities. <coughs> the second example of taking an old script and understanding and analyzing its structure and then developing something new is the work of Christian Serkis <coughs> for his MA project um, that he called Thuleya, which was bas based on the <coughs> I take a break. <laughs> Which was based on the Diwani script, and then he developed, he took the structure, analyzed it, and made a modern font that is based on Diwani, but you would not call it Diwani, although it has some characteristic similarities. <coughs> and the other extreme is to drop all this and look at the structure as a structure, and look at, um, at, 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 at fonts as a system of geometry and construction. So this is a work from um, Lada Aswad on, uh, on a font that she called Tabati because it was used for book teaching kids how to play and with, with, with rubber stamps make letters, but also make drawings, and sort of bringing uh, a playful element. <coughs> Um, this is an example from a Muhtara fonts, uh, font designed by Kamil Hawa and Yara Khouri. <coughs> and here again you see an influence of this modern uh, flat-based typography that was very popular in the 1960s, but then combined with a calligraphic detailing of the endings, and then also a playfulness in the forms, and a, sort of something to do with handwriting. And this, um, this is a, a design studio that is specialized in um, in branding, and they always do fonts that are bilingual, and they do specific fonts for the clients. So they have a whole language attached to this that is be that is separate from tradition, but that is specific for a specific um, visual image that they want to achieve. Then the last, uh, <coughs> the last thing I'm going to say, no, the last thing, uh, the last tradition, uh, or the last new trend is um, typesetting bilingual 
texts and looking at studies of how to bring the two scripts together. This is the work of Nadine Shaheen, which was also for her MA project, where she actually designed the Arabic and then developed the, the Latin to match with it by stretching the Latin and forcing it to go in the direction and proportions of the Arabic. So when you look at this Latin typeface, it's not distorted from the image, but it has something very wide, and it has, it's very fat on the horizontals, which is not normally how our Latin is. So it's an inverted contrast, what they say in type design. Um, so this was another attempt. Uh, we started in the Red Foundation in 2005, a project of also looking at uh, the opposite direction of Nadine. Actually, Nadine was also part of the project. Um, to look at existing Latin fonts and say, what can we do that make uh, a harmony between creating an Arabic that would be like a good companion? Um, the project was, was very successful, and, but also it received some criticism because people always look ideologically, but they don't actually look. Um, because if you look at these typefaces, for example, in this example, Lara Khoury worked with Fritz Meyers. She developed the Arabic, and she looked at the way the Arabic, the, the Latin was originally handwritten, what tools was you were used, and then they applied these tools in writing the Latin, uh, the Arabic, and eventually that gave a specific form. Um, <coughs> Here another example where the, 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 you have a combination of the Latin and the Arabic, and the Arabic that was intended to look like, like handwritten, very informal handwritten text, because they believed that when you use it very small, it was very legible, and it is. <coughs> okay, I will skip. Um, this slide is uh, and one of the last projects I will show from this project. Uh, where uh, it was a collaboration between uh, a renowned um, <coughs> calligrapher, Munir Asharani, and, uh, and, and a type designer. And it was the most radical one. And it makes sense that a calligrapher who wants to work on typography will go all the way. So he made no concessions. He made inventions that were um, very dissociated from calligraphy because in a way he believed, and, he, and I kind of agree with him, that you cannot if you recreate calligraphy digitally, it's just a recreation. And if you use a tool, you have to think of how this tool is, is going to be employed. And this design has to be, you know, why should we make text that looks written fast when actually we're not even writing, we're typing? So you have to change the way you think. Um, but that is in an, a an, an direction. I don't think there is one way to do it. So I'm not going to evangelize on this. This is another example of looking at, at, at this combination. So this is a work by uh, Titus Mamus, who's an Austrian um, designer who actually took and uh, recre revived um, the, Ma the Maghrebi script of the Imprimi National, the Imprimi that we talked about before from the 17th century, and then he developed the Latin for it. So this was a revival is always you make a little bit of modification so it becomes actually type. Okay, and nowadays the possibilities are many. So this is an example from the work of Pascal Zorbi, who's done uh, different fonts, so always collaborating with another type designer who does the Latin, and they work at the same time on the script. They look at different directions. So he's done also work that are branding based, like the design for the font in this museum, actually, and Mathaf in Qatar. So. You probably will see his work also in real life. Um, this font was designed based on marrying sort of a hybrid between the, 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 the readable Nasr and then the Kufi, because the Kufi looks more modern or more, um, yeah, simpler. OK, and the last project. Promise. <laughs> Two seconds. The last project I want to show you is the last typographic matchmaking project that we are working on, where we actually, I believe you can inspire, get inspired by all sorts of things. And one of the things that we want to do in this project is bring, um, in a way, a political statement by bringing Arabic tifina, which is the Berber script, and Latin in one font family, and looking at ways to combine these scripts that are really very, very different. And the Tifina script, um, so this is an example of the Maghribi, like the work of Kandusi, that we think one of the designers thinks is a real inspiration. And this is what they are trying to do. So taking the principles of Kandusi's quirkiness and then trying to translate that into 
a Latin quirky one, and then turning it into Tifina. Tifina normally looks very geometric. So this is the last slide I show you. So this is the inspiration, something of combining scripts that normally don't talk to each other. Tifina is very geometric, but then you can, you know, how do you make these two have something? So it's a, it's a kind of a, a challenge that we just started. And with that, I say thank you. And I hope I did not make too much.